October 24th. We'll be covering a number of different topics during today's presentation, and we'll have several guest speakers. First, we'll discuss legislative and advocacy issues in New Jersey and on a national level. Then we'll get a New Jersey Division of Taxation update from our friend Marita Scarata. We'll provide the latest information about efforts to provide alternative pathways to CPA licensure. And we'll also discuss the AICPA's new quality management standards and the new retirement plan mandate for New Jersey employers. And throughout the program, the winners of this year's NJCPA Ovation Awards will be announced by Jesse Hirschbein, the chair of our Volunteer Relations Committee. <sighs> okay, so let's get started. Um, we'll start by introducing our panelists. On my immediate left, of course, is AJ Johnson, CEO and Executive Director of the NJCPA. Welcome, AJ. Thank you. And to AJ's left is June Toth, NJCPA President and a Principal at Wilkin Gutton Plan. Thank you. Welcome, Good morning. June. Welcome. All right, so uh, AJ, we're going to be talking a lot about the pipeline today. Uh, so why don't we start off by talking about our pipeline advocacy work group, or the PAGA, as I like to call them for okay. short. That's a new one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'll start with the Pipeline Advocacy Work Group. It's comprised primarily of high school and college educators and others with ties to the education community. Exploring advocacy avenues to increase availability of accounting education and funding in high schools and higher education, including minorities. Our efforts will include getting accounting designated as a science, technology, engineering, and math subject, or STEM. Uh, and that would open up increased funding and promotion within the educational system and offer more opportunities for students. Additionally, we're looking at identifying existing state grant programs that accounting students can take advantage of. And we're also exploring legislation that would buttress accounting education. And we're making lawmakers aware of the dire consequences of an accountant shortage. Having New Jersey incorporate accounting as a major prong in its workforce development programs is another opportunity. And I'm proud to share that we are working with the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, or NJBIA, who is assisting us in this effort. So, AJ, you, you talked about um workforce development. You know, for the last, I guess, two years, the profession's really been looking at the, the staffing challenges. We've been using the word pipeline a lot. Sure. And I think what that does a lot of times is it focuses on staffing challenges and, and trying to get more uh, graduates into firms or accounting and finance departments and companies and so forth. But in looking at it as more workforce development, that really starts to highlight the importance of the accountant shortage as it relates to businesses, individuals, municipalities, right. and even, even the economy. I mean, do you agree with that? I would agree 100% with that. And that's why we have the focus on workforce development and are partnering with NJBIA because we understand that it's so critically important not just to talk about the pipeline, but what we can do today as part of that effort. Right, and also I think it brings us sort of on the same level as other professions that are also struggling to find people. I mean, it's well documented about the nursing shortage, teacher shortage, years ago it was an engineering shortage. Right. So it brings us up to kind of that level. So it's less about, it gets us out of the accounting bubble and kind of uh, elevates the discussion a little bit. And you you really uh, touched on a very important point. We, we really don't want this to just be in a bubble. Mm -hmm. We need for our lawmakers to understand the impact on the economy, you know, what that means to jobs, and also if you don't have the people to do the work, what that means to municipalities, to major corporations, there's immense impact. And so uh, we want to get ahead of that right. in our conversations. Right, so you mentioned lawmakers. Um, for a lot of the things that we're trying to accomplish vis-a-vis -vis the pipeline, there's probably gonna be some legislation required. So June, do you wanna update members on sure. some of our legislative priorities? Absolutely. So we spoke recently with Senator Vin Gopel, chair of the New Jersey Senate Education Committee, who has offered to sponsor legislation that would add accounting to middle school and high school financial literacy requirements. We're supporting federal legislation that would designate accounting as a STEM subject, opening it up to more government funding in K through 12 grades. We're continuing to support legislation providing for more state funding for professional boards like the State Board of Accountancy for New Jersey. We're supporting legislation that would piggyback New Jersey to IRC, Internal Revenue Code 1202, 
which provides capital gain tax breaks for certain investors and startup companies. And we're reviewing the AICPA NASBA competency-based experience pathway to CPA licensure and UAA proposals. More on that later in the program. I also want to mention some recent deadline extensions. Taxpayers affected by Hurricane Helene in all or parts of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, those taxpayers have until May 1st, 2025 to file their 2023 tax returns. And the EBP audit deadline was also extended. So part of uh, legislative activity involves pressing the flesh at activities. We have a, a few uh, activities and events coming up. Do you want to share those with members? Absolutely. So uh, one that we're excited about is the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Walk to Washington is returning in February, specifically February 6th and 7th. NJCPA will have a presence there, so we're looking forward to that. It's also an election year for New Jersey, so it should be well attended by lawmakers. And we're also hosting uh, NJCPA CPA Day uh, in Trenton on October 28th with invited emerging leaders, our key persons, as well as NJCPA leaders. And the purpose behind that is really to educate our members on the importance of advocacy, allowing them to also meet with lawmakers. And we attend events on a regular basis with our legislators to keep the CPA profession on their radar. I remember the year that uh, Governor Murphy ran for the first time. He was on the train ride. He walked the entire train. And since it's such an open field on the Democratic and Republican side, it'll be interesting to see which of the candidates or the aspiring candidates um, the show audience. up to yes. yeah, show up to the walk to Washington. For sure. so. uh, the professional also advocates on a national level. In a moment, we'll play a video where Katie, to me, Kate Kiley, Director of Congressional and Political Affairs of the AICPA, provides an update on some key issues impacting the accounting profession. In the full video, she also provided an interesting explanation of the upcoming election and what could happen depending on the outcome of the pres presidential, Senate, and congressional races. We don't have time to play that full video during today's program, but you can access it at the link provided in your handouts. Here's Kate. Hi, everyone. I am Kate Kiley. I'm with the American Institute of CPAs uh, advocacy team uh, here in Washington, D.C., um, and I'm so thankful to be with you all to give a quick brief update on what's going on in Washington. A lot of what happens on, on issues that the profession is following, and I'll, I'll just go through a few real quickly, depends really on the outcome of the election. Um, in terms of beneficial ownership information reporting, BOI reporting, uh, there are two kind of major pieces in the works right now that, that the advocacy team is working on. One is a um, bill with Congressman William Timmons from South Carolina. He's been working very closely with, with us, with um, some other interested stakeholders, as well as with FinCEN um, to try and get a statement around um, the unauthorized practice of law to provide some safe harbor there, as well as um, a safe harbor for uh, enrolled agents and CPAs, as well as uh, attorneys who might work on client um, BOI forms. So that bill hasn't been introduced yet, but they're working really closely together to try and get to kind of a final final package. Um, and we'll see that I think the, the as soon as Congress comes back and bills can be introduced again. The other issue is, as part of the National Defense Authorization Act, and you may remember that BOI initially passed through the Corporate Transparency Act on a National Defense Authorization Act about three years ago in, 20, in 2020. It was for the 2021 um, NDAA. Uh, there's a potential for, and some amendments have been submitted in the Senate, although the Senate hasn't finalized their NDAA yet, um, but some, some amendments have been submitted to potentially push off FinCEN BOI for a year um, to, to prevent enforcement for one year. Um, we'll know more as that lame duck session sort of works out and whether or not either of those bills get picked up as part of a lame duck package. Um, but the association and our advocacy team will be pushing to try and get those over the finish line in the, in the next couple of months here. The other major issue that you should be aware of um, the Federal Trade Commission and the non-competes rule that came out in um, January of 2023, about a year ago, and then finalized 
uh, in April of this last year was struck down uh, by a judge in Texas in August. Um, as part of that judgment, the FTC, the, the judge explained that the FTC has no authority to ban non-compete agreements. So for now, although non-compete agreements were supposed to, the, the ban on non-compete agreements was supposed to go into effect on September 4th, um, it's no longer effective. So the FTC is not pursuing right now um, enforcement and has no legal standing to do so. They're considering an appeal um, and it would go to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals likely, uh, but it would take years to adjudicate. So for now, the issue is dead. Um, the FTC has sort of gone back to the drawing board and is trying to figure out what to do next. Uh, and then really in terms of um, next steps for the profession headed into the 119th Congress, we anticipate and we still anticipate a major 2025 tax package of some sort. What it'll look like honestly depends on the election. We won't know um, what sort of treatment partnerships receive, what um, sort of tax breaks are included or not included, what happens until we sort of see how how the election sort of apple tree shakes out. And we'll know more um, hopefully in the next few weeks and we can give another update following, you know, the clarity that we get from the election. Thanks to Kate for that update. Before we move into a discussion about the importance of advocacy and the roles that the NJCPA and the New Jersey CPA Political Action Committee, or PAC, play, I'd like to share some news that came out today. As you may know, earlier this year, Barry Melanson announced that he will be retiring from his role as CEO of the AICPA in SEMA. Today, AICPA and SEMA announced that the incoming CEO will be Mark Koziel, CPA, CGMA. Mark has worked in, a, in various roles at AICPA for more than 14 years, most recently as vice president of firm services. I had a chance to interact with him when I was uh, working globally in a global capacity as the executive for a global accounting association. And I know that you will join us in welcoming Mark when he assumes the CEO role in January. So now let's move into our advocacy impact discussion. First of all, the NJCPA lobbies for and against legislation. The NJCPA PAC also is a nonpartisan organization. Its funds are used to help elect New Jersey lawmakers from both parties who support our profession. The PAC allows the profession to fight unfair legislation that hurts CPA firms and their clients, and also to support legislation that benefits CPAs and their clients. And joining me for this discussion are Carrie Duda Wilson, CPA, an audit manager with Wilkin Gutton Plan. She's an active member of NJCPA and committees and interest groups, including serving as vice chair of the Strategic Planning Committee. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you for having us. Pleasure. And Kate Zeck, CPA, who is a partner at PKF O'Connor Davies and serves on the NJCPA Board of Trustees as secretary. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. And I'd like to thank both of you for your leadership. Thank you, of course. So let's talk about why a culture of advocacy is important. To me, it means that we solve pain points for the profession and we focus on solutions. Mm -hmm. What about you? I know personally being involved with the NJCPA, one of the biggest things that we're facing as a profession is the pipeline. And we just had a whole presentation about what the NJCPA is doing to advocate for problems to uh, fix the pipeline issue. So that's so important. If we're not involved in the conversation, we're just gonna be left behind. Absolutely. Kate? Yep, I agree fully. And we also need to be able to look out for the profession and make sure that our interests are being well served. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So why do you both give to the NJCPA PAC? So interesting enough, I wasn't really involved in the NJCPA PAC for the longest time. I really had no idea what they did. Um, but I attended uh, the NJCPA convention and I heard a presentation by Jeff Kazerman and he really was able to explain effectively to me what the benefits are of contributing to the PAC and what the mission and the vision of the organization is. Um, we're all accountants, so I know the numbers really spoke to me when he showed me that on a per member basis, our membership only gives $4 per member to the PAC, 
whereas other organizations have their own respective PACs and they're giving substantially more. Um, I believe the numbers were $30 for dentists, uh, for realtors, $52 for dentists, and $175 for uh, trial lawyers. So that to me showed me we were being left out of the conversation because we were only giving $4 compared to 175 it all makes a difference too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, for myself, I mean, I'm a small business accountant, you know, family held organizations. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that those are the heart of the New Jersey economy. Yes. Uh, and I think that the issues that those businesses deal with speak to us as CPAs as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it made sense to me to want to belong to and contribute to an organization that would have our best interests at heart and could effectuate change in the state and at the legislative level. If not us, then then who? Because exactly. you know mm -hmm. we represent the profession and the interest of CPAs and accounting professionals here in the mm -hmm. state. Yes, right. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So I often hear people stating things about the PAC that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, so why don't we go through and just debunk some of those myths? Uh, first of all, PACs are evil or corrupt. <laughs> so not true at all. Um, so the NJCPA is actually a legal, effective, and ethical way of um, supporting candidates that really support the CPA profession and the businesses that we work with. I personally feel like I'm running from deadline to deadline and I never have enough time in the day. So I feel like the PAC is doing that heavy lift for me with investigating those candidates, vetting and advocating on my behalf when I don't have all that time. And then once the PAC provides information, then I can do a little bit deeper dive into that. That's great. The next myth is that PACs buy votes. Yeah. So like Carrie alluded to, I mean, you know, there's only so many hours in a day, but mm -hmm. what the NJCPA PAC will do is support the legislators who are pro-CPA, pro-business. We want to help them get elected. We're not necessarily going out and saying, you need to vote for these people. Uh, factors that go into deciding which candidates will receive contributions from the NJCPA PAC includes the candidates' voting records, seniority, their relationship with the society, and its members. Uh, those allocation decisions are made after hearing input from all of us, all sectors of the NJCPA and PAC contributors. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, people sometimes think that all of the PAC's money supports one political party. So not true at all. It's actually a nonpartisan um, party where it supports all different candidates. It all goes down to what those candidates actually value and support and what their policies are. So I know the money that I contribute is going towards something that is really going to impact me as a profession. And like Kate said before, it really goes into their track record on what they vote and what they support is where the money goes to. Exactly. PACs often get compu confused with super PACs. So, yeah, and that about. makes sense because you hear the media, you know, they're calling super PACs. But what those are is they have no limits on how much money that they can raise um, and spend. And they actually don't have to disclose where their funding comes from. Uh, but with the NJCPA PAC, we must follow strict regulations. So those disclosure requirements are regulated by the New Jersey Election Law Enforcement Commission. And there's limits on how much our, our PAC can raise and how much it can contribute to individual candidates. There's also some confusion between lobbying versus PACs and how that works. So what the NJCPA does with lobbying is completely different and separate from the PAC. Um, you were highlighting before what the NJCPA was doing with the lobbying, but really lobbying is a sense of meeting with legislators, testifying, and really getting those grassroots efforts support. Um, by law, the NJCPA isn't allowed to contribute any money to a political ca candidate, which is where the PAC comes in, because then they can support candidates differently than what the NJCPA can do. And another myth is that you have to give a lot of money in order to make a difference. No, we know that's not true. So at this point, you can contribute whatever you can, you know, be it $5, $10, just get involved. Um, what actually does help is if we have a higher percentage of members that do contribute, um, because it shows that we care about you know, what happens in this state in, in the business and industry as well. So it's, it's really just a matter of contributing what you can. That's great. Some people also think that you have to be an executive or a partner level to contribute. Nope. 
Um, so I'm a manager and I can contribute, but you could be a CPA, you could be a non-CPA, pretty much anybody can contribute to the PAC at this time. Yes, mm -hmm. anyone who supports CPAs in a profession, that's what it boils down to. Yeah. All right, so I wanna thank you both Carrie and Kate for being here today and I hope that you know the information gets out to our members and encourages some some giving now that we've clarified some of those myths I think it's so important and I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jesse to announce some of the winners of our ovation awards this award honor superstars whose exemplary efforts and stellar achievements are advancing New Jersey's accounting profession. So Jesse, over to you. Thank you very much, JJ. As this year's chair of the NJCPA Volunteer Relations Committee, it's an absolute honor to be the one to announce the very deserving winners of our 2024 NJCPA Ovation Awards. Our first category is exceptional educator. These individuals are college accounting educators who have distinguished themselves through excellence in teaching, active promotion of careers in accounting, and serving as student role models. This year's exceptional educators are Danielle DiMeglio, Tony Lynn, George Maglieri, Anne Badenitz, Congratulations to all of the winners. Thank you for inspiring the next generation of accountants and professionals. Our next category is emerging leader. These are our savvy up and coming superstars who have been working in the accounting profession for 10 years or less and have noteworthy accomplishments. Keep an eye on this list of people, my friends. Someone here may become one of our future trustees or maybe even our next president. The winners this year are Michael Caro, Matthew Centeno, Richard Douglas, Rory Gannon, Derek Leone, Eric Menino, Jenna McDonough, Matthew Mojica, Matthew Stenger, and Lexi Wilson. Congratulations to all of these winners. Thank you all for continuing to push our industry forward in a positive manner. Now, stay tuned. I have to take a quick break to make a Taylor ham, egg and cheese sandwich for myself and Don Meyer, but I'll be back later in the program to announce some more winners. I am excited to turn the program over to an update from Maria Scarota, the director of the New Jersey Division of Taxation. Unfortunately, Maria is not able to join us live today, but she did pre-record her update to make sure that you received the latest news from the state of New Jersey. Please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A section during this video. Maria will answer them after the broadcast and the NJCPA will be sure to distribute the answers to all the attendees. Take it away, Marita. Good afternoon. I'm Marita Scarotta, Director of the New Jersey Division of Taxation, here with some updates from the Division of Taxation. And I'm very sorry I can't be with you live, but feel free to post questions and be assured that the NJCPA will forward any unanswered, uh, well, they won't be answered, uh, any questions that are submitted post-presentation to me for response. Okay, ready? Let's go. So, in general, there's some housekeeping, and there should be a slide that will come up telling you, again, that there are multiple ways to reach the Division of Taxation should you need some help. Um, certainly, the Tax Practitioner Assistant Hotline and email are um, probably the best ways to, to contact us. If you have a question that has to do with individual income tax, the number is 609 633 66 Seven. Business topics are available at 609 633 6905. If you need to send an email, you can send it into practitioner.tax at treasure.nj.gov. There is a link to the practitioner email, again, available on this slide. Something really um, I think is that's important to note, um, and uh, it, it just occurred to me as I'm talking about this that I really 
want to I should have brought this to the top of, of the uh, my notes here, but um, we are launching an appointment scheduling system. Um, it's going to start with the tax practitioner uh, and tax professional hotline, um, in fact. So it may very well be something that you're interested in. I know that there's difficulty sometimes, particularly during filing seasons and and peak quarterly filing and remittance seasons, it's difficult to get through to the call center. We continue to uh, train personnel to bring them up to speed, to allow them to answer your questions that are tend to be more sophisticated than um, just a regular taxpayer calling in. But providing this appointment system will do a couple of things. It'll assure you that you'll have a place in line and you'll actually speak to somebody for a set period of time, 15 minutes, a half an hour or something of that sort. Um, you may be able to talk about more than one taxpayer at a clip. And um, just knowing that you can set an appointment, um, even if it's not immediate during that day, but later on in a week or even a month in advance, will probably be um, a, a better time management tool for a lot of people. So I think that that is going to be grand. Again, we've already started using the appointment system um, in small ways with our regional information centers, but we're going to be putting, a, a, it'll be a first fly out, I believe by the end of the year in December, uh, certainly by January, 2025. So uh, let me talk to you a little bit about hiring. And I know I talked about uh, this before in, in July, um, we have picked up um, well over 200 new people at the Division of Taxation backfilling a lot of positions, lost to attrition um, and retirements. Um, we are still slightly under our, our, um, our, our fully um, funded positions of uh, just about 1460. Um, we're slightly under 1400 right now. Um, and we're kind of in a slow period of, of hiring. Um, we did pick up a number of new auditors. We continue to be challenged by the loss of folks leaving for uh, either the private sector, but again, primarily for the IRS. Um, it, in, compared to some states, we haven't lost a lot of people, but we have lost between eight and 10 auditors over the last 12 months. Honestly, it's been unusually quiet, which I probably should knock some wood on um, since the budget period uh, ended at the end of June. Um, we are working through some, uh, the big property tax relief programs, which I'll start through talking about in a moment. But overall, there haven't really been any hiccups or large changes in, in law that um, would have upset the apple cart and created a lot of controversy um, here, So, which is a good thing. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that you're finding the same. Um, just to reiterate some of the budget updates that we spoke about um, a couple of months ago, uh, there are no significant changes to the gross income tax. Um, just a reminder that if you um, or your clients are considering purchasing a zero emission vehicle, a ZEV, um, that effective October 1st, there is a sales tax that is imposed on the purchases of those new vehicles. It is at the half rate and will remain at the half rate um, until for about nine months until July 1st, 2025, when the full rate will be imposed on the sales of ZEVs um, at uh, the regular 6.625 rate. The corporate transit fee is uh, continues to um, march along and is um, included on all our upcoming um, corporation business tax returns. Um, certainly, if there's anything that you need to, um, there, our website is uh, your best place to go to in order to take a look at any updates um, and changes in the law, or um, certainly uh, we continue to post guidance, technical bulletins, and the like. Please continue to look at the web page. Uh, for the Division of Taxation frequently. Um, at, at, I would suggest that at the very least, at, at least once a month, just to see what updates are out there, um, if there is any, there are any news alerts um, or changes that would be of interest to you. Okay, um, I did speak about this in July, uh, just for everyone's awareness. New Jersey is a participant in direct file. Um, this year, this was a program that was rolled out by the IRS. 
last year with 12 states uh, cooperating, they've picked up another, uh, I think, 18 of us, um, 18 states now, uh, maybe it's a total of 24 of us that are actually participating in the entire program. That math doesn't really equal out, but you'll know what I mean. Um, what that ultimately does is it provides a free filing option for folks to file uh, with the IRS and points them towards states where they are a resident and can also file um, in a in a kind of an integrated tax mechanism. Now, New Jersey has had a free filing option for many years. What free file does is it, it actually points a taxpayer to that free filing option in New Jersey and with the taxpayers um, complete cooperation. In fact, they have to initiate it will allow for the transfer of data to come over to um, the state of New Jersey's gross income tax return and uh, kind of help facilitate the filing. So know that that's out there. Um, we expect that to, to see that go live, um, hopefully early on in the, the tax filing season. Um, and we'll, we'll just wait and see how, how it goes, quite frankly. Um, it's the first time for everything. The senior freeze, for those of you who um, have clients who are um, of, a, of an age of 65 or older or uh, disabled and are homeowners, um, by now I would like to think that the property tax reimbursement, or as it's colloquially called, the senior freeze, you're well aware of this program and know that it is underway. So there's a couple of things that you should know about this. Those checks started going out in July. Um, but the deadline to file for the, a senior freeze for the 2023 tax year is October 31st, 2024. So um, if you encounter a client or a friend or a relative who may be eligible for this program, um, time is getting short. So let's get those papers uh, in. Going forward, um, with some legislation that was passed in a previous budget, uh, there's a program called Stay and J that, among other things, is calling for a consolidated return, a simplified return that will allow residents to file not only for the senior freeze, but also for the anchor benefit. And um, depending upon how legislation churns out over the next couple of months, um, the Stay and J feature, which permits taxpayers who are of the age of 65 and older who are homeowners uh, to gain 50% um, of the property tax that they paid on their resident up to 6,500, um, also incorporating the other monies that, that they may have received from the senior freeze and or anchor. Um, but the big news about this, and we've, again, this is not new news, but um, currently the way that the legislation is crafted, this is for people who, again, are 65 and older, own a home in New Jersey, um, and make uh, earn income of $500,000 or less. So it really broadens the pool of people who can get some type of property tax relief in the Garden State. Um, Anchor um, consumes a lot of our attention this time of year. Anchor, which is the um, affordable New Jersey communities, homeowners and renters uh, benefit program. Um, the payments are going out right now. Uh, applications can still come in. Uh, the, the deadline for filing is uh, November 30th. Um, to date, uh, we, have, we have just released the first uh, batch of payments. So to date right now, uh, we've paid over $1 billion to um, a little over 1 million taxpayers. Payments will continue to go out on a rolling basis, um, several scores during the course of a week. Um, that would be direct deposits and checks. And um, there is additional security that has been uh, attached to this program uh, called IDME. It's the same IDME program that is employed by the Department Department of Labor uh, for New Jersey, as well as the IRS uses it and Social Security Administration. Um, it has been a, a very helpful element for us to control and identify and thwart um, fraudulent attempts to file in the anchor program. Something of interest that um, 
that I'd like to share with you is that uh, our audit activity is looking to start up a process called mini audits. Um, we are um, literally stealing this from another state. Um, one of our assistant directors went to a conference and um, was very impressed by how um, a, a Midwest, Midwestern state was employing mini audits, mini audits to not only help train our new auditors, but also to look at new businesses, help them understand what their uh, compliance uh, responsibilities are, um, look over their books, show them where they may need improvement or to give them assurance when they're doing well, and periodically check up on them um, as we go. So it is a good compliance tool, um, and hopefully this will uh, allow for a greater assumption of, of uh, voluntary compliance around the state. You're probably wondering about STAR, which is the tax integration system that we've been talking about for uh, the last couple of years. We are, the good news is, we are still scheduled for a release in February 2025 of the sales tax family. I expect it to be a seamless transition. You really won't see too much of a change um, as we transition from our mainframe system to this new uh, web-based um, computer system. Um, there will be a portal that will be um, afforded for people to use. We are not making the portal mandatory. It is completely elective at this particular point, but it will give some flexibility to you as a tax practitioner or the or the um, taxpayer themselves to have a, a, a better inside look at some of the transactional history that has happened in the account, to see notices, to see letters, to see their own correspondence that has come into the, to the state of New Jersey. Um, it'll That will help our people to see a much more holistic look of what's happening with uh, account, an account. So we're really looking forward to seeing this get off the ground. Um, we are wrapping up a, a major training of our change agents at the division, people who are going to be like a, a super user um, who will be training the rest of the division. They are finding that this system is easy to use, that it has splendid features, and there's a lot of excitement and buzz around the division about us being able to onboard this new system. So we're really looking forward to it and hoping that, that you're going to find that it is easy to, as easy to use as we believe it really is. So um, in fact, we've actually started working on phase two planning. Now phase two, which we'll probably see as a rollout, I think around 2026, possibly 2027, this will include the growth, um, excuse me, the gross income tax employer family, the, the corporation business tax family. It will also include a case management and case selection um, element. So um, it should help us better target taxpayers that we should be looking at and uh, not looking at taxpayers who um, uh, are, are not at audit risk or shouldn't be at audit risk. Some really good news here. Uh, the CBT regulations, for those of you who are, uh, wait, have been waiting with bated breath for us to release our new CBT regulations, the, Attorneys General's, the Attorney General's Office has finally responded back to us with their reviews and comments on our draft regulations. Um, we've done the final cleanup. We've resubmitted them out. So we expect that the promulgation of these uh, CBT regula regulations will occur by the end of this calendar year. So we're holding a very good thought on that. Um, so stay tuned. We'll be posting that, of course, on our website as soon as it occurs. So if you submit questions, the Society will forward them to me for review and response. It's really been a pleasure to speak with you and share this information. I thank you for the opportunity and very much look forward to seeing you live on the next Issues Watch. Have a really good afternoon. Thank you very much for that, Marita. As always, Marita provides such valuable information and we're very fortunate to have her for today's program. Oh, hang on, let me check if I got any ketchup on my face here now. All good? All right, here we go. It's time to announce our next two categories of the Ovation Awards. First up is Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award, which honors champions who work endlessly and passionately to make the accounting and finance profession open, welcoming, and fair. This year winner is Nicholas Vaccaro. Congratulations, Nicholas. 
Our next category is impact. This award recognizes those who gave back to the community, shared professional expertise to support others, and advanced the interest and need of the accounting profession through active engagement, leadership, or advocacy. This year's impact recipients are Tim Garrity, Frank Boudelet, Ted Carnival, Marty Davidoff, Bridget DeSouza, Carrie Duda Wilson, Carol Ioka, my good friend Jay Levine, Vincent Riley, VJ Sammy, David Smith, Dr. Blockchain Sean Stein Smith, and Darren Thomas. Congratulations to everyone. Well, I'm all out of Wawa coffee, so it's time to take another quick break. But don't worry, I'll be back to announce some more winners soon. Looks like Don has finished his sandwich, so now I'll turn the program back over to him, Don. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I'm back, uh, and we're going to get into the meat of the CPA pipeline discussion. So recently, the AICPA and NASBA published two proposals. One to provide an alternative pathway to CPA licensure and the other to make updates to the Uniform Accountancy Act or UAA. With us to provide details on these two proposals is James Cox, Director of State Regulation and Legislation with the AICPA. James, over to you. Hey Don, thanks very much for the, the invite today. Very much appreciate uh, chatting with the NJCPA. Um, as you mentioned, the AICPA and the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy released two exposure drafts in September. They are different, I like to say that they're different uh, yet uh, related. Uh, the first exposure draft pertains to the uh, a competency-based experience pathway or framework that allows CPA candidates to demonstrate professional and technical skills in the workplace after uh, earning a bachelor's degree and meeting, and meeting their state specific requirements for accounting and business courses. This pathway is the result of a joint AICPA and NASBA working group. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think about and you know, the, the competency-based framework and some of the you know, feedback that we've received is that you know, this is kind of a foreign concept or you know, it may be perceived as such, but it is fairly common among other licensed professions. You know, for instance, the, uh, the architectural profession last week released a competency-based framework that was the result of a years-long uh, practice analysis. So it, it is nothing, it, it's something that's not new, but I think it is to some degree new for the uh, CPA profession. And the it, much like the experience requirement that's already in place for licensure across the 55 US licensing jurisdictions, the competencies which comprise so that competency year, so it's a two year experience requirement with one of those years focused on the development of competencies, which would be evaluated by a licensed supervisor. So that, that supervisor must be a, a licensed CPA in their respective states. And the, the goal of the framework is to provide candidates with flexibility um, while certainly maintaining rigor that is needed to protect the public. One of the other things that I think is very um, intriguing about a competency-based framework is the ability to adapt to an evolving practice. So it is, when you know, included uh, in the licensing process, it, it certainly isn't as rigid as, say, kind of an education requirement where we're seeing a significant um, kind of discussion around the number of hours needed for a bachelor's degree. You have many states who are contemplating, um, you know, what a bachelor's degree kind of outside of accounting might look like in the future. You know, currently that's at 120 hours, but some states are contemplating and, and kind of researching a 90 hour bachelor's degree. Um, you know, the, I think, the, I think there's a QR code that's going to be available. So we would encourage everyone to submit some comments on this. We very much value that input in, in terms of refining um, you know, what this might look like. And there's a 90 day exposure period 
Um, so the the deadline for the comments uh, for the specific or for the exposure draft specific to the competency based framework is December sixth. Um, ultimately, the AICPA and NASBA boards will um, kind of vote on the revisions uh, to the exposure draft and something will likely be released early next year. Um, as I mentioned, the, you know, the, the two exposure drafts are different but connected um, and the UAA exposure draft, I think for those listening in today, I, I, I wanted to give a little background on the Uniform Accountancy Act. Um, it might set the stage a little bit for kind of the, the highlights that I'll provide. But the Uniform Accountancy Act is model legislation developed by AICPA and NASBA, uh, which have done so uh, for decades um, in the hopes of creating a significant level of uniformity across state lines to assist the CPA profession in, in providing and practicing across state lines and certainly to protect the public. Um, but the exposure draft, again, it's, it's different, um, but it does include the competency-based pathway as a model or as a, as a uh, way in which uh, CPAs can be licensed in the U.S., um, it also, the exposure draft, and, you know, I, I'm always available to answer questions. AJ, Don, you uh, certainly know how to find me. Um, but so the, it, it is a bit technical in nature. And so we're, we're very much happy to kind of chat with anyone who is interested. Um, but in addition to the inclusion of the competency-based framework pathway, uh, the proposal also sets the education requirement to sit for the uniform CPA exam at a bachelor's degree. And that was specific because, again, we're, we're trying to be um, cognizant of the potential changes related to um, accounting hours in the future. It uh, also, and I think most importantly, at least you know, to some degree for me, because I very much look at the pipeline as a continuum, and by that, I mean, it's not just uh, recruiting um, or encouraging candidates or um, you know, high school or you know, anyone interested in becoming a CPA kind of at the beginning of the pipe pipeline, but also ensuring that in the middle of the pipelines, it, it, you know, existing licensed CPAs have the ability to practice across state lines and to service clients wherever those clients may be. And so part of that is certainly keeping folks within the profession who we have fought so hard to get into the profession. And a key to that is the, the ability of CPAs who are licensed in one jurisdiction to practice across state lines without the need to obtain an additional license. So to that effect, the exposure draft keeps mobility in place for those licensed under a pathway defined within the UAA. And it also facilitates a means to allow state boards of accountancy to identify those licensed under a pathway that is not deemed substantially equivalent. And by that, I mean uh, substantially equivalent would be the pathways uh, delineated in the Uniform Accountancy Act through a national licensee database. Um, so Don, I'll stop there. I know I've gone through that fairly quickly, but uh, I, you know, I have been invited back, I think, to do a deeper dive on a webinar in the future. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm also always available uh, to kind of answer any questions. Thank you, James. Yeah, there actually were a couple of questions that, that came in uh, from our members. Um, the first one kind of revolves around the, the competency-based requirements. Um, I won't I won't ask the question exactly the way the, the viewer asked it, but um, would you say that the, the competency-based competency -based requirements, is it sort of a, a soft landing as opposed to a hard break from the extra 30 credits? You know, it's interesting. I, you know, I, Don, I, I focus primarily on the licensure of CPAs, kind of in my role at AICPA. And, you know, the when the the thirty hour rule was implemented many years ago, you know, the, the it was designed to allow for specificity. But I think one of the things that we have kind of discovered over the years is that you know maybe there was a desire to have specificity. 
And so I think the the competency-based framework is is an attempt to to rectify that to a certain degree, but it is also, I think, a a way in which to recognize the you know the feedback that we received through the National Pipeline Advisory Group from employers that you know. Uh, candidates have to be competent in certain areas. So it, it, it's a reaction to, to a variety of different external factors. Okay. And a way I would imagine to provide or to ensure that graduates receive a, a general work experience as opposed to being dropped into a specific area of a firm and, and just focusing in that particular area? Sure, sure. Um, one other question, uh, and actually I'm going to ask it because I asked it when uh, we sat in on the uh, presentation you did for state society uh, personnel, and this one relates to what if a candidate, and I guess this would relate mostly to business and industry, what if a candidate doesn't report to a CPA? How would that individual kind of make this new process work? And I understand that that's a concern even now, because if you work in business and industry and don't report to a CPA when you fill out that experience requirement form in different states, including New Jersey, sometimes that can be a challenge. Is that something that was discussed? It was. And, you know, much like the existing system across the 55 licensing jurisdictions, it is ultimately up to, to the state to determine it, what that relationship, uh, you know, what the candidate's relationship is to the licensed CPA who uh, essentially signs off on that experience or determines if they've met those competencies. Um, we have a number of states, you know, today that require a, a licensee, you know, still require a licensee to be supervised by a, uh, or a candidate to be supervised by a licensed CPA. So there are challenges. And, you know, the, the hope is that, you know, states will look at language that will kind of allow, again, allowing for consistent flexibility to increase that pipeline. Um, Don, before, uh, I, I don't know if I necessarily kind of address this, but I did want to encourage the attendees today that, you know, if they or their firms would like to comment on the exposure drafts, which we hope they would, um, the, you know, for the UAA specific exposure draft, I would encourage everyone to focus on that mobility piece. So, you know, if you're practicing across state lines and if you are taking advantage of that, um, you know, that ability that you've enjoyed for many years, if you could comment on that as well, um, it's something, again, very important that the UAA committee will look at in January and refine the proposed language. So we really need to hear uh, a variety of perspectives on the mobility aspect of the exposure draft. That's great. That's actually an excellent transition. And if you can stick around, uh, I'd love for you to hear uh, June and AJ talk about the discussion that was had at our September board meeting. I'll turn it over to June. June's going to talk a little bit about the discussion the board had, and then AJ will talk a little bit about our position. You might actually have questions for them after they're done. So June, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. So at the most recent uh, Board of Trustees meeting, we had breakout groups and a discussion to um, talk about the various proposals and what we agreed with and what we thought um, was most important to support, including mobility. So we do support, the board does support the 120 hour position of the bachelor's degree with the two years of experience and a form of mobility, whether it be termed automatic mobility or something similar, because we all recognize in the current environment that we've been in, particularly with working remotely, and that you know we often cross those state lines and need to have that ability to serve our current clients that are located in states outside of where we may be physically located. And part of that discussion, James, was you know that we want to make sure that the process isn't onerous uh, for members, for small firms. We understand that uh, CPAs are working in different settings, you know, considering the recent question around um, having a supervisor as the CPA evaluator. Sometimes that's not the case where we may have, you know, one CPA uh, uh, in an organization. So, you know, those are the considerations. So when we talked 
um, as a board, we really focused on what would be most seamless for, for our members at this point. So that's where the conversation went. And we plan to submit a letter on behalf of NJCPA. And uh, we'll also share that letter with our members. And if they'd like to use that, uh, you know, in support of their own position, then we're encouraging that also. So I'm sure that you will see some communications, you know, from us on that. Great, AJ, I, I, think, I think that's, uh, you know, as much, uh, as much engagement as the NJCPA can foster throughout this process, I think would be tremendously helpful. Um, I like to, I like to say that we as a profession are very much at a pivotal moment in terms of what the profession will look like in the decades to come. So as many voices as, as can, you know, as we can hear would be tremendously helpful. I, I appreciate that. Also, I have a question on process. So you mentioned the comment period. Will those comments be open, you know, public to everyone? Will we be able to see other comments? How will that work? Yes, so great question. So uh, yes, the, uh, the public or the comments will be made public. Um, we are working on kind of the, the, the platform by which to, to, you know, make sure that the uh, profession stakeholders have that information and can see what their colleagues are saying across the country. Um, it really is a, an effort by AICPA and NASBA to be as transparent as possible with, uh, with this process. You know, as I mentioned, again, it's, it's a pivotal moment for the profession and it's a very exciting moment. I, I certainly appreciate the amount of angst that we're going through. But as you know, someone, and you, you've called me this before, who uh, is a, a bit of a historian slash professor related to CPA licensure, it is a very exciting time. And so I think uh, as open and transparent as we can be, uh, we're, we're going to, to be that transparent. Thank Great. you. Well, James, thank you very much for the presentation. Just as a reminder to the viewers, <clears throat> the deadlines for submitting comments are December 6th and December 30th, respectively. Is that correct, James? That's correct, absolutely. Okay. And we'll make sure that everybody uh, gets a link to the presentation that James is gonna do for us next month. Again, thank you very much, James, really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day, thanks so much. Okay. One way that you can all help with the CPA pipeline is to sign up to make presentations at your local high school or alma mater. We'll provide you with the PowerPoint presentation, the talking points, you can sign up at the link on your screen. And now back to Jesse for more Ovation Award winners. Thank you so much, Don. And I will make a remark that I have spoken at high schools and colleges in the past and the response we get back from the students when they really hear somebody who's engaged and enthusiastic about our profession, it's just so rewarding. So I encourage everybody if uh, to go onto their volunteer profile and, and fill this information out so that uh, we can reach back out to you and we can go to these high schools and reach out to these students. Let's get back to the Ovation Awards. Our next award category is innovation, which acknowledges those who are driving accounting innovations, such as leveraging new technologies, using forward thinking data analytic strategies, or implementing alternative business models. This year's winners are Kevin McElgin, Sarah Snell, and Philip Sukram. Thank you to all. Mental note, now we know who to ask about converting those PDF files. Next up are the women to watch. These female NJCPA members exhibit outstanding leadership and contributions and a commitment to fostering the ongoing success of their colleagues. The winners are Karen Albanese, Ann D'Amico, Lisa Ferrer Develt, Kelly Kalea, Alyssa Leach, Shannon Mosier, Amy Perone, and Danielle Weiss. Congratulations to all of the winners. But that's not all, there's more. I'll be back one more time to announce this year's big award, the Lifetime Leader. Back to you, Don. 
We're now gonna move into a couple of professional issues updates. First up is the AICPA's new quality management standards, an important issue that CPA firms need to be taking action on. The AICPA's Ahava Goldman recently appeared on the Issues Watch podcast with Brad Muniz. Here's a clip from that discussion. Can you please tell us what the quality management standards are? Sure, it's my pleasure. Um, so the quality management standards supersede the existing quality control standards. Okay, good. And there are three quality management standards. Statement on quality management standard number one, a firm system of quality management. And that's the one that supersedes what we refer to as, as QC10, quality, a firm system of quality control. And you know, when we changed from quality control to quality management, I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, no, this is a good thing. Because when you think about control, you think kind of like pest control. And when you think about management, you think about asset management. Like, you know, you manage your staff. Maybe you want to control them, but you know you can't. So we changed it to quality management. The QM2 is engagement quality reviews. And while that's a new standard, what it does is it takes the quality what used to be called an EQCR, an okay. Engagement Quality Control Review, is now called an EQR, an Engagement Quality Review. And it just takes all the requirements for an Engagement Quality Control and it puts it in one place. Because before it was in um, GAS and it was in the QC Section 10 and now it's all in one place. And then there's QC Tech, QM3, which just had some conforming changes. And there's SAS 146, which is engage, quality management for engagements performed in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. But mostly when we talk about the QM standards, we're talking about QM number one. See, and Q, the one thing I like about it, this is gonna sound silly, but you know me, I focus on, on dumb things. QM two, quality management number two, change it to EQR. And yeah. I kind of aligned it with the PCOBs. Because we were EQCR, and I was talking with somebody from the PCOB one time, and I said the EQCR. They're like, no, 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 we're EQR. It's like, can, it's, can we just align? So, oh. um, so it just, that alone made me happy. I, 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 you've I made my day. You <laughs> you've made okay. my day. But you're right. The big one, the big, big, big one, I feel is quality management number one. Right. And so what's the big, big change with quality management number one? And the big, big change is that we put in a risk assessment process. So the other change is that there's also a new component, information communication, but honestly, firms have already been handling information communication. We just kind of formalize that. But the big, big change is we put in a risk assessment process. And what's really good about that is it says to firms, this is not a standard. This is a scalable standard. This is a standard that requires you to think about what your firm does. What are your firm's engagements? What are the risks to quality in your firm? And you need to think about that, and you need to identify those, and you need to put in place what we call quality responses. So not every risk rises to the level of a quality risk. A quality risk is something that, this is gonna sound familiar to anybody who does audits, magnitude, likelihood, and magnitude. You know, it's likely to, to affect the, your quality, and if it happens, it's going to be bad. And then we talk about a response. What's a response? A response is policies and procedures. So that's the big, big difference with this standard. Is And, you know, firms, your listeners are not starting from scratch. They already have got a system of quality control. So what do you have to do? You can't set it and forget it. This is why, you know, people say, why are you making us do this? Because it's been 10 years since we changed the standard. And people complained that the standard was too prescriptive and making us do things that, that you know, weren't relevant to your firm. Well, now we've got a, a standard that says you got to do what's relevant to your firm. So you got to take the time because it's part of managing your practice you can access the full episode at the link on your screen. Ahava is also presenting a webinar for us on November 12th and November 26th. Register at the link on your screen. Um, so June, um, just to be clear, these standards 
are not just for firms that do audits and not just for firms that go through peer review, correct? That's correct. So they are the quality management standards, formerly known as the quality control standards. And it really is a firm's um, tone at the top and how they are going to operate their firm in terms of quality. And you need to assess your risk, which is part of the new element. It has to be implemented by the end of December of 2012. It was a three-year phase-in project, so that should give you a clue that this is a heavy lift. And if a firm has not looked at this yet, time is running out and they need to start you know, addressing it now because 2025 should be the year to work out any of the kinks before it goes live. So if you have a peer review, if your peer review year ends in 2025, after December, you would be under the new standards. So it's really, really important to nail this down and be compliant. Okay. So definitely make sure you watch the full episode. <clears throat> All right. New Jersey recently implemented a new retirement plan mandate for New Jersey businesses with 25 or more employees. Here's a short clip from a recent Issues Watch podcast episode where Chris Fundora of Trap Agen CPAs and Advisors discusses the program. Governor Murphy signed the New Jersey Secure Choice Act in March of 2019 to essentially create this program. And so now we're at the point where we went through an initial phase of, of essentially a beta test, and now it's live. So as of June 30th of 2024, uh, the program is now live, and they've been sending out notices to companies throughout the state uh, to essentially kind of accomplish the, their objective, which is that they want to help private sector employees to start or to build upon their retirement savings. And so I think that the intent is good, um, but ultimately, some of the way that it's getting positioned is that it's sort of a hands-off approach for employers. And I don't see that being the case. You know, with most things of being a business owner, uh, very few things are hands-off. So when it comes to sort of how it's impacting companies in New Jersey, basically what the rule states is that if you have 25 or more employees in uh, working for you in the past calendar year, then you need to register for this program. Part of what we need to know to communicate this and plan for this well is part of you know, what is the definition of an employee? So I think a lot of the times we default to what a qualified plan calls an employee, right? Somebody who works for you for a thousand hours a year, they're 21 years of age. But in this program, that is not the case. So a qualifying employee is someone who is 18 years of age, regardless of how many hours they work for you. So if you had at no time last year, 25 or more, so if you had less than 25 at any time last year, then you don't have to participate. But if you had 25 or more throughout last year, and you've been in business for two plus years, whether you are for-profit or non-for-profit, you are mandated to participate in this plan. And again, it's age 18, regardless of hours. So that's the context. Those letters have been going out. And part of it is that the letter is basically stating that by the state's records, you need to either register or certify that you are exempt. But the onus is not on the state to prove that. The onus is on the business owner to either register or certify that they are exempt. So the state's very clear that they're saying, essentially, you need to look at your prior year numbers and you need to determine, and then you need to let us know one way or another. Accountants need to be prepared to provide the guidance in this arena. So one is gonna be whether that individual needs to register or not, because there are penalties involved if they don't adhere to the rules or if they don't follow the plan um, appropriately, if they make some issues. And then the other thing is that we have to provide that, that guidance and in, in guidance in counsel in terms of whether they should be utilizing the state-sponsored IRA program or if they should be operating their own 401k plan. You can access the full episode or watch the recording of a webinar Chris provided at the links on your screen. Um, so AJ, I, I did that interview with Chris 
And one of the things that he and I both agreed was that the state's heart is in the right place. I mean, every week I read an article about, you know, my generation, Gen X, not being prepared for retirement and so forth. Um, but it's still a mandate. And a mandate for employers by connection becomes a mandate for the CPAs that they work with. So, um, I mean, is this something that, that you and Jeff Kasman have a lot of conversations with, with lawmakers about? Yeah, I think it's really important that they understand that there is this trickle down effect. And so they say that it's not really that, you know, time intensive as an employer, but it is a mandate. So I would just say, make sure that you're having the conversation with your uh, small business owners, your clients to make sure that they are aware because there seems to be some lack of awareness still around mm -hmm. it and um, to just be ready to support that process. Yeah, June was saying that uh, there was some concern that the notifications that got mailed out, somebody might just thought it was junk mail yeah, and, and awesome. threw it away. Right. Yeah, so that, that I think for everything either that happens at a federal or state level, it's imperative that CPAs inform their clients and others because there's just, you know, you think about BOI and there's just so much lack of information exactly. out there and awareness. Exactly. Yeah. There's quite a bit out there. And it, there hasn't been a lot of media coverage on the retire ready. Right. No, I mean, I don't think other than what we've done, I don't recall I reading anything it. about it, to be honest with you. Yeah, so. All right. We're in the home stretch. Here are a few updates on NJCPA programs and services. We just launched a new website called the NJCPA Marketplace, a one-stop shop to find products and services for your business needs. There are more than 400 companies listed, ranging from banks to law firms to software providers and more. Some even provide member perks, such as special discounts or offers for NJCPA members. I encourage you to look at the car insurance because car insurance rates are through the roof. Uh, you can recommend providers you currently work with. And if you work with a company you, you don't see listed, use the Suggest a Company tool to let us know about them. Access the marketplace at the link on your screen. The annual NJCPA food drive to benefit the Community Food Bank of New Jersey is running through November 15th. Visit the link on your screen to find out how you can make a monetary or food donation. Please help us to exceed the 2,300 pounds of food and $22,000 in donations we received last year. If you are an NJCPA affiliate member, you know uh, is in the process, if you or an NJCPA affiliate member you know is in the process, sorry, of taking the CPA exam, we're providing 10 $750 awards to help cover the exam fees. Enter the CPA exam fee lottery at the link on your screen. Today's broadcast is part of Membership Plus, the series of webinars that come free with NJCPA membership. Upcoming events include a program on digital fraud and scams and how generative AI plays a role, offered on November 4th with a replay on November 12th. The next Issues Watch live broadcast will be on December 10th with a replay on December 17th. And do yourself a favor by attending our January program on heart-centered leadership. Register at the link on your screen. And now I'll turn the program back over to Jesse for his final Ovation Award announcement. Thank you so much, Don. It's been so exciting announcing all of the Ovation Award winners so far today. It's an amazing feeling to know that we have so many deserving and dedicated people working so hard in our state to make our profession better. And it comes all down to the Lifetime Leader Award. This recipient is a standout NJCPA member, member excuse me, who has exhibited a long history of volunteer service to the accounting profession and the NJCPA, including a current position on the New Jersey State Board of Accountancy. This year's lifetime leader is Bob Fodera. I know I speak for everyone at the NJCPA when I say thank you, Bob, for your many years of dedicated service to the profession and to the society. And thank you so much for the entire NJCPA staff for allowing me to be part of this amazing annual tradition. Don, back to you. Thanks, Jesse. And congratulations to all of the Ovation Award winners. That wraps, wraps up today's broadcast. Good things. I can't speak anymore. Uh, many thanks to AJ, June, and all of our guest presenters for their updates.